For a long time, castles were the backbone of power in medieval Europe. They weren't just walls and towers, they were statements. Whoever controlled the strongest fortress controlled the land around it, and for centuries, that was enough to keep most enemies away. But things started to change when gunpowder appeared on the battlefield. At first, it seemed like just another invention. Loud, messy, unreliable. But the first time a cannonball shattered a castle wall, everyone understood. This was something completely different. Sieges that used to last months could now be decided in a single day and the rules of warfare began to shift faster than anyone expected. All those high towers that once made a fortress look powerful now turned into targets. The taller the wall, the easier it was to destroy. It didn't matter how thick the stone was, physics had finally caught up with courage. By the end of the 15th century, Europe was covered in castles that no longer worked. They still looked impressive, but they couldn't do their job anymore. And as more of them fell to artillery, one question started to bother every ruler, every general, and every engineer. How do you build something that can survive the age of cannon fire? That question would lead to a new kind of fortress, one that looked nothing like the castles that came before it. When gunpowder began changing the face of warfare, Europe didn't abandon the idea of fortresses. It simply started to rebuild them from the ground up. That transformation began in Italy, right at the start of the Renaissance when architects and engineers were beginning to look at war through a more scientific lens. The old round towers, which once looked so imposing, had turned into perfect targets for cannon fire. A ball of iron would hit the curve directly, sending all its energy straight into the wall, and within a few hours, what took decades to build could collapse into dust. So, builders began to experiment with something new. Instead of curves, they started working with angles, realizing that the key to survival wasn't thickness, but geometry. If every wall could support the next and every angle could cover its neighbor, the fortress could defend itself as a complete system rather than a collection of separate towers. From that logic came the bastion, a triangular point of defense that projected outward from the main wall, creating overlapping fields of fire. Each bastion protected the one beside it, forming a perfect network of sight lines and crossfire. From above, the whole fortress looked like a star, symmetrical, precise, almost too perfect to belong to the Middle Ages. And yet, that design worked. For the first time in history, engineers had created something that could truly fight back against the cannon. It wasn't stronger by chance, it was stronger by design. Once engineers understood that tall towers couldn't survive cannon fire, they started rethinking the fortress from its very foundation. If height had become a weakness, then the only logical step was to build lower and wider, shaping the walls so they could take a hit and keep standing. But it wasn't just about size anymore, it was about how the walls behaved under pressure. Instead of building everything out of solid stone, which cracked easily when struck, they began using layers of different materials. Stone on the outside, brick and packed earth inside. It sounds simple, but it worked. When a cannonball hit, the wall didn't shatter. It flexed a little, spreading the force through layers that could absorb it. Even the outer slope, called the glacis, was designed to make cannonballs bounce upward instead of slamming straight in. Inside the fortress, the same thinking continued. Passages curved slightly, so the blast from an explosion wouldn't travel too far. Gunpowder was stored underground, where it stayed cool and dry, and the firing positions were cut at an angle, giving defenders a clear line of fire while keeping them protected. Everything in these forts had a purpose. Nothing was there by accident. It was practical, efficient, and built to last. And as these designs spread, the idea of what a fortress could be started to change completely. As these new forts spread across Europe, one feature quickly became their defining mark, the bastion. It looked simple at first, a triangular platform that stuck out from the main wall, but the idea behind it was brilliant. From a bastion, defenders could fire along the sides of the fortress, covering the walls that used to be blind spots. That meant no one could get close without being seen from at least two directions. Each bastion worked together with the next one. If attackers focused on a single wall, the neighboring bastions could fire across it, trapping them between overlapping lines of gunfire. 
This design completely changed how sieges worked because it took away the attacker's biggest advantage, the ability to find cover. Every open space in front of the fort was exposed and the closer you got, the worse it became. Inside each bastion, the setup was surprisingly complex. There were platforms for heavy cannons, small gun ports for hand gunners, storage rooms for ammunition, and narrow stairs protected from enemy fire. Even the angles of the walls were calculated so that smoke could clear quickly after each volley. Everything in that layout served a clear purpose. No decoration, no wasted space, just function. From above, the fortress looked like a star, but from the ground, it was more like a puzzle. Every angle depended on the next, every wall was part of a bigger plan. It wasn't beautiful in the usual sense, but it worked. And that was all that mattered. As the shape of these new fortresses evolved, so did the weapons inside them. Each bastion was built not just for defenders with bows or crossbows anymore, but for a new generation of artillery. Heavy cannons were positioned along the outer walls aimed to sweep the open ground between bastions. When attackers tried to approach, those guns could fire along the flanks, sending iron shot across the entire front line. Behind the cannons were smaller guns called falconets. Light, fast-firing pieces used to hit targets that slip past the main batteries. And higher up on the ramparts, soldiers with early muskets filled in the gaps. Their job wasn't to stop an army, but to make sure no one could get close enough to plant explosives or scale the walls. Together, it created a kind of layered firepower, slow and heavy at a distance, fast and precise up close. Inside the fortress, everything was organized with the same level of planning. Gunpowder was stored deep underground in dry chambers to prevent accidental explosions. Air vents carried away smoke after each cannon shot so the crews wouldn't choke. Some forts even had underground wells and cisterns because during a siege, running out of water could be as deadly as enemy fire. Life inside these walls was tough, but it worked like clockwork. Every gun crew knew its position, every soldier knew where to go when the alarm sounded. The whole place felt less like a medieval castle and more like a machine, built to survive long enough to make the enemy give up. Once these star-shaped forts appeared, attacking them became an entirely different kind of war. A direct assault was pointless. Anyone trying to storm the walls would be cut down before getting close. So instead of charging, armies began to dig. They built trenches in long zigzag lines, slowly creeping toward the fortress under a thin sense of safety. Every few meters, they'd stop, reinforce the trench and move their artillery forward, trying to get close enough to do some damage. As weeks turned into months, the battlefield began to look like a maze. Trenches zigzagged outward, counter trenches cut them off and the entire area became a grid of mud, smoke and desperation. For the attackers, it was all about endurance. Every day spent in those trenches meant more disease, more fatigue, and fewer men left to fight. For the defenders, it was patience and discipline. If they held long enough, if their supplies lasted, the enemy usually left first. And that's what made these sieges so different. They weren't won by bravery or by speed. They were won by whoever understood the math of survival better. But by the 16th century, the Bastion Fortress wasn't just a clever idea anymore. It had become a military standard across most of Europe. Kings and republics alike were spending huge sums to modernize their defenses, and entire regions began to change shape because of it. But over time, success brought its own problems. The more forts were built, the more armies learned how to attack them. By the late 17th century, sieges had become almost predictable. Engineers on both sides followed the same principles, and wars turned into slow, mathematical routines. You could look at a map and estimate exactly how long a fortress would last before surrender. Then, artillery changed again. New weapons could fire shells in high arcs, dropping them straight into the courtyards that once felt safe. The very geometry that had made these forts unbeatable now worked against them. The low, flat shapes that deflected cannonballs offered no protection from above. And just like that, the age of the Star Fortress began to fade.
They were still admired for their precision and beauty, but war had already moved on. Even after they stopped being practical, star forts never really disappeared. Many of them were simply too well built to destroy. And over time, they found new purposes. Some became prisons, others turned into military academies, and a few, like the fortifications of Palma Nova in Italy or Bortange in the Netherlands, turned into entire living towns. People built houses inside the walls, markets in the old courtyards, and life slowly replaced the sound of cannon fire. <laughs>